welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker, and I'm the Executive Director of Speaking of Women's Health. And I am so glad to be back in the Sunflower House with you today. And on this episode of Speaking of Women's Health podcast, we're going to talk about dizziness, uh, migraine headaches, lightheadedness, vertigo, specifically benign positional vertigo. Now, some of the information I'm going to go over is information that our recently graduated fellow, Dr. Alexa Fifik, who's now in her own private practice, Concierge Medicine of Westlake, she wrote this column about a year and a half ago, and it's on our speakingofwomenshealth.com. And other information I'm going to go over about benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, also known as B, as, as in benign, PPV, paroxysmal positional vertigo. Paroxysmal means it can come on just at any time, and it's just absolutely miserable. And even though we call it benign, uh, it's not always, uh, it doesn't feel that benign to the poor people that are suffering from it. And some of this information is on the clevelandclinic.org website under health and disease. Now, I did want to interview one of the best experts in the country on dizziness, vertigo, migraine, vestibular migraine, Dr. Neil Cherian. He's very, very busy. He's a Cleveland Clinic neurologist. And I send him some of the toughest, toughest cases in women that I see, and he is really just superb. But this information is so important to get out that I just didn't really want to wait. Um, and I've just seen over the years many people suffer with symptoms and I just think it's important to understand this. So what, what is it about women in dizziness? Well, we know certainly women uh, have migraine headaches. And since women have pregnancy and ovulation and menstruation and hormonal fluctuation, hormones, certainly the fluctuations can trigger migraine. And in some people, they just have dizziness. You know, you might think that dizziness has a singular definition. But um, being dizzy can mean a lot of different things to different people. To some, it might feel like the room is spinning, which is kind of vertigo. To others, it might just be a sensation of lightheadedness or even like you're about to faint or pass out. The good old-fashioned simple faint is also known medically as vasovagal syncope. And I've had a couple of good friends who also happen to be patients recently have uh, syncable episodes, uh, very different reasons but and different consequences, but it can be very, very distressing. So benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, the BPPV, is a very specific type of vertigo that we see, and it's caused by uh, loose crystals in the inner ear. And it can be diagnosed by your doctor or APP, um, and it can also be improved with in-office or home exercises or very specific directed physical therapy. Similarly, many patients may experience dizziness with migraines or with cervicogenic, meaning in the neck, headaches. But dizziness can have more sinister causes, such as cardiac arrhythmias. In fact, early on in my practice, um, I saw a man from out of state who had um, syncope, unexplained, hit his head, had some trauma, and we uh, were just starting to get the 30-day cardiac monitors. And sure enough, he had a cardiac arrhythmia. And it was caused from Lyme disease, actually, which was treated, and then he needed a pacemaker. And no more syncopal episodes after that. People that are very anemic, specifically women who have heavy menstrual periods and get iron deficiency anemia, 
can sometimes get very lightheaded and dizzy and it can put quite a strain on the heart. And my very first podcast was on iron and everything you want to know about iron. And iron is so important, not just for the blood, but energy level and hair. Uh, Low blood pressure. Um, Sometimes as people get older, the reflexes are a little bit slower. And going from a sitting to a standing position, the blood pressure can drop. Uh, Neurologic conditions, POTS uh, can also cause significant changes in blood pressure and um, can even precipitate syncope. So if you are dizzy, lightheaded, or certainly if you've had passing out episodes, you must be evaluated medically. If you have very new onset dizziness uh, or new or worsening headaches or headaches that have changed uh, in frequency, or if you have associated nausea, vomiting, Uh, dizziness or vision changes, you really do need to seek medical attention sooner rather than later. Now, headaches are really one of the most common neurologic disorders, and up to 75% of all adults have had at least one headache in the last year. In most people, the headache pain is usually felt in the head or face, but there's over 150 different types of headaches, some much more common than others. Now, if you didn't catch my earlier podcast on migraine headache, uh, please be sure and go back to listen to that. That was specifically directed to migraine headaches in women and some of the female aspects and influences. So two of the most common types of headache condition are cervicogenic headaches and migraine headaches. Unfortunately for some women, headache disorders seem to be a lot more common in women than in men. So 70% of all migraine sufferers are women. And we've got specific information by a woman's health neurologist, Dr. Julie Buckland, on our speakingofwomenshealth.com, a Cleveland Clinic neurologist uh, that specializes in headaches in women. Now we've talked about migraine before, but even though we know a lot about migraine, there's still a lot of things that we don't fully understand. It's usually a recurrent headache disorder that can involve chronic intermittent attacks, and they can last from a few hours to several days. They're usually described as moderate to severe, usually on one side uh, or located in the front or the side of the head or near an eye. And it's commonly described as being pulsating. It's worse with physical activity. It can be associated with sound sensitivity or light sensitivity. Flickering lights is what triggers me. Uh, And nausea. There can be associated vision changes and dizziness. Now, a prodrome is symptoms or a group of symptoms that occur up to a few hours uh, to a couple of days prior to the onset of a migraine attack. And for some people, the prodrome may be fatigue or neck stiffness or light sensitivity, or sound sensitivity. Nausea, yawning even can be. Every time I say yawn, I want to yawn. (laughs) Pallor, being pale, having blurred vision. Or some people just have trouble concentrating. A postdrome is symptoms that occur following the resolution of a migraine attack. And they can occur for up to 48 hours. Some people describe fatigue or difficulty concentrating or neck pain. We really need more research in this area because we don't really have sufficient data about postdromes and migraine. Now, aura. Aura is the medical term for a neurologic symptom that occurs with migraine that's not part of its core features. So it could occur before, during, or after the actual attack. And this may be a change in vision. That's how I know I have a migraine is I have impairment in certain aspects of my vision. There can be changes in sensation like touch or smell or even taste. Some people can have speech and language changes. Um, There can be even brainstem function changes that involve the gait. Most people have visual auras. Those are the most common. And of the people that have migraine with aura, 90% of them have visual changes. Now, the menstrual cycle relationship is 
about 10% or less of women can get migraines when they have their menses because when the estrogen levels drop, that can trigger both menses as well as headaches. Most menstrual migraines are not associated with aura. Um, the attacks can be longer and associated with a higher rate of nausea than non-menstrual migraines. So sometimes we use longer acting trip dance like Frova for menstrual migraine. Unfortunately, in perimenopause and menopause, they can get worse uh, because the hormones are fluctuating more. And if you haven't listened to my podcasting of my book, Updated Version, The Cleveland Clinic Guide to Menopause, it has everything you want to know about perimenopause and menopause. Usually, these perimenopausal headaches uh, resolve or lessen in severity once a woman is fully in menopause and has cessation of that ovarian hormonal fluctuation. Now, menstrual migraine treatments uh, can be controlled by using hormonal birth control on a continuous basis because it prevents ovulation and stabilizes the hormone levels. In the past, some physicians thought that they couldn't give hormonal contraception uh, for migraines, but most of the time you can We'll be back after a quick break. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG, and we're the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. So let's move on to now talk about cervicogenic headaches. Um, They can be caused by disorders in the neck, the cervical spine, and all the adjoining anatomical structures. This type of headache is usually one-sided. It can be caused by the three uppermost nerves in the neck. Um, And sometimes it can be hard to differentiate it from migraine. Up to 50% of cervicogenic headaches can be misdiagnosed, leading to the wrong treatment choices. There is evidence that Botox, which kind of paralyzes muscles, um, can actually, uh, and medication don't seem to be helpful, whereas Botox can be quite helpful for migraines. With cervicogenic headaches, actually, physical therapy can be helpful. So... If you're not sure what type of headache you're having and you're not getting relief, that might be an indication to ask for a referral to a headache specialist to help determine if this is cervicogenic or another type of problem. Usually, cervicogenic headaches are made worse with neck motions and movement or prolonged weird head positioning. Everybody is looking down at their cell phones all day long or any kind of external pressure over the head and neck. There's other reasons, of course, for dizziness. We sometimes see it in low vitamin B12 levels. And so the recommended daily allowance for males and females is 2.4 micrograms. But if you're low in vitamin D, your physician might recommend oral at 250 micrograms to even 1,000 micrograms or injectable supplementation. Vitamin B12 is considered safe Um, And your body's pretty good at absorbing what it needs. Although it's very complicated, the absorption. You need salivary factors, intrinsic factor in the stomach, and an adequate ileum, which is the distal small intestine to absorb it. So it's not surprising why, especially in older people or people with bowel resections or gastric surgeries, uh, can be low in B12. And there's also medications that... Uh, can lower B12, metformin, glucophage is one, and the PPIs, the stomach acid blockers, are another. And our current uh, first-year fellow, Dr. Rachel Novick, just posted an updated column on everything you wanted to know about B12. And there's different forms of B12, like adenosylcobalamin and methylcobalamin, which is already pretty active, and hydroxycobalamin. 
If you cannot swallow a pill, there's sublingual uh, that dissolves right under the tongue. And there's even a nasal B12 gel. If you're constantly lightheaded, that can be a sign of congestive heart failure. Um, so if you experience new lightheadedness or other heart failure symptoms like unexplained rapid weight gain, like three pounds in a day or five pounds in a week, if you notice dependent pitting edema or swelling in your legs and ankles and feet or abdomen, and also if you have difficulty breathing, that's new or worse, especially if it happens when you lay supine on your back. Sometimes people can feel dizzy as a sign of a drug allergy, and some people hyperventilate and simply are pretty stressed out, and um, even uh, hyperventilation can cause low CO2 levels, which can cause numbness and paresthesias. Certainly, if you have new onset headaches or the worst headache of your life or a thunderclap headache or any headache with significant neurologic symptoms, uh, such as any facial drooping or uh, funny feelings in the face uh, or other compromise, then this could be a stroke or a brain tumor, a transient tumor attack or a transient ischemic attack. So it's very important to be medically evaluated. So you have been listening to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast with your host, Dr. Thacker. And we're in the Sunflower House and we are not getting dizzy talking about all these causes of dizziness. Um, but if it causes you to pass out, um, and I was, I was mentioning some of my good friends, one of them started intermittent fasting to improve insulin levels and blood sugar levels, and she's an intense exerciser. She was a little dehydrated, <laughs> and it was a particularly hot day and an emotional one because she was standing um, and was at a grave site for a burial of a friend. And all of those factors can be quite the setup for vasovagal syncope, where uh, the blood pressure goes down, sometimes the person gets bradycardic, and there's not enough blood flow to the brain. So this caused her to fall down and bang her head. Um, and the trauma of hitting her head moved the crystals in the inner ear and gave her a horrible case of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And so that's what we're going to talk about next, BPPV. And it's an inner ear disorder. People can experience like a sudden spinning sensation whenever they move their head, especially moving backwards. Um, and <clears throat> it's not generally a sign of any kind of serious brain problem, but it's very uh, uncomfortable and annoying. And if it doesn't go away within a few weeks, there are in office procedures that your physician can do to manipulate your head and neck to try to get those crystals back into place. So we have the outer ear, the pinna, the inner, the middle ear with the ear canal, which sometimes gets clogged with wax. And um, that can cause some dizziness and ear symptoms. Then you have your middle ear, the eardrum, and there's fluid behind that. And then you have the inner inner ear which is the composed of three semicircular canals and little calcium crystals that move and the sensation of these crystals depending on which of the three semicircular canals you have send impulses uh, through the eighth cranial nerve which is responsible for hearing and balance and it's actually one of the most sensitive nerves in the entire body. And when these calcium deposits and particles from the utricle get trapped in the semicircle canal of your inner ear, that can be a big problem. Because any little change in head position, like tipping your head backwards or just sitting up in bed, can lead to this sudden vertiginous feeling like you're on the worst amusement park ride of your life. And that's one thing that I do ask uh, patients to get an idea 
about their inner ear sensitivities. Are you someone who loves amusement park rides or can't stand them? People who don't like them tend to get motion sick a lot easier. Are you one of these people that can't uh, read while you're moving, like uh, in the back of a car? So um, it's kind of important to know. Now, usually, like I mentioned, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo isn't a sign of a really serious problem, and in a lot of people, it can disappear on its own, but it can take longer, and many people are very frightened, and it may be more dangerous in adults over the age of 65, because if the dizziness causes someone to fall, and you have osteoporosis, uh, even if you don't have osteoporosis, you still can maybe perhaps have a fracture, although most fractures from a standing position in an adult over 40 does indicate a fragility fracture or a so-called low trauma fracture, which is osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. And one in two women get osteoporosis. So if you haven't boned up on osteoporosis, you've got to go back and listen to my vitamin D podcast, which was my third podcast, or my calcium podcast on on Memorial Day, um, as well as interviews with physicians and experts about osteoporosis treatment, or the nice overview uh, chapter that I do uh, in my book, The Cleveland Clinic Guide to Menopause. So who gets the BPPV? Well, it can happen really in anyone, but it's more common over the age of 50. And half of people in this age range experience at least one episode in their lifetime. And it can affect children, but it's rare. In fact, I recall a couple of episodes as a young um, elementary school children, child when I would turn my head or move fast, I would feel like the room was spinning. So I presume it was those crystals somehow getting in the semicircular canal causing that. It is overall the most common inner ear disorder. 20% of people who are evaluated for dizziness get have a diagnosis of this benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So um, until it's successfully treated, uh, it, it can keep coming back. And some people can go months or even years before they have another episode. My friend who had the vasovagal syncope from dehydration and fasting and standing up without moving and getting the blood flowing passed out because of low blood pressure and syncope, but then she ended up with uh, this positional vertigo from the head trauma. Of course, she went for emergency care and evaluation of blood work and CAT scan of the brain. And so that's kind of like a big deal that, uh, and scary for people to go through. But then it was so bad, she couldn't lay back to go to sleep. Um, When she went to the hairdresser's, to have her hair colored. She couldn't lean back in the seat. She'd actually have to go home to um, rinse out the hair products standing up in the shower. And so I referred her to a physical therapist that specialized in those maneuvers. Uh, And then they taught her to do the maneuvers. In fact, most people, she said, uh, usually get cured within, you know, eight visits and she needed the maximum number of visits. And so uh, it can really be very disruptive because if you're vertiginous, you can't be driving. <laughs> and so uh, it really impacts uh, your life. Some people uh, may not have, they may have vertigo from a more ominous or sinister cause. That's why it is important to see a physician and get an exam. Now, people who get very vertiginous may get nauseated and actually uh, vomit. It may appear that they have balance problems because they're not sure where their head and body are in space. And there can be rapid eye movements uh, called nystagmus, depending on the head movements. Usually, this only affects one inner ear at a time, but sometimes it can affect both. And the trigger is always a change in the head's position. And um, even just tilting the head can happen. And age is a risk factor because there's more wear and tear of your inner ear structures over time. 
but this may just be a symptom of something else going wrong in your inner ear, like labyrinthitis or vestibular neuritis or even a acoustic neuroma, which is a tumor on the eighth cranial nerve. Some people may have this positional vertigo and have migraines. And it's not uncommon for this to develop, as I mentioned, after a fall or accident or sports injury. So um, it's, it's very important to make sure that these calcium uh, deposits aren't in the wrong place. And they can roll around and push on those little hair-like structures called the cilia in the inner ear, mm-hmm. which are there to transmit the information to your brain about where your body is in space. And anytime you stimulate those little cilia, it neurologically stimulates your brain. So getting a history in a physical is important. The fastest way to cure it is involving physical therapy exercises to get those calcium particles out of the semicircular canals and back where they belong in the uh, utricle. Um, Sometimes we'll prescribe motion sickness medicines like Anavert, but they're not usually used long term. There are certain exercises that can be done. They're called canalith repositioning procedures. They take you about 15 minutes to complete. And particle repositioning involves a series of physical movements that change the position of your head and body. And these actions shift the otoconia out of the semicircular canals, those calcium crystals, and back to their proper location. And a single particle repositioning is effective in treating 80 to 90 percent of patients and I think it's important for all people who've ever experienced this to get the instructions on how to do the physical therapy and exercises themselves. So um, if you experience this or a loved one experiences this and they've been evaluated and they know that it's this benign, paroxysmal, positional vertigo, you can have them sit on the bed or table and turn the head 45 degrees to the affected area. This is 90 degrees. Quickly lie back, keeping your head turned towards the affected ear as you lie back with your head slightly over the edge of the bed or the table. And wait about a minute if you can before you stop having symptoms. Without raising your head, Turn your head quickly in the opposite direction so that your good ear is parallel but slightly over the edge of the table or bed. And again, you need to wait about a minute or so. Then roll onto your side and continue to turn your head another 90 degrees in the same direction so that your nose is now facing the floor. And keeping your chin tucked towards your shoulder, sit up in the direction your body's facing. And follow any post-particle repositioning instructions that the physical therapist or physician gives you. Yes, uh, benign positional paroxysmal vertigo can go away on its own, but it can come back and it's a terrible feeling. So you want to know how you can reduce your risk. Try to avoid head trauma. Wear that bike helmet when you're biking or playing contact sports. In general, the prognosis is good, but dealing with these symptoms can be scary and frustrating. So that's why you need to be empowered to know how to do the exercises. The symptoms when you get them, if they're so severe, it might make you so nauseated that you actually throw up. And if you throw up and you're dehydrated, uh, that further makes it more likely that you might pass out or have trouble standing or walking. If you have dizziness combined with any severe headache or chest pain or a regular heartbeat or slurred vision, this could be a could be a brain attack, i.e., a stroke. So call 911 immediately. So the Cleveland Clinic has a lot of great resources 
about benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And it has explanations and pictures describing the semicircular canals and the utricle and uh, otoconia, which is the medical term for those tiny calcium crystal particles that become dislodged. And then the cochlea is that snail shell sense organ in your inner ear that translates sounds and nerve impulses. And your inner ear, as I mentioned, and the eighth cranial nerve is the most sensitive nerve in your body. And hearing is an important special sense. And it's very important to protect your sense of hearing. I see everyone walking around with earbuds. And sometimes you can tell the volume is so high because I can hear the music or whatever they're listening to. And of course, I hope that you listen to our podcast regularly with or without earbuds, but please be sure to keep the volume down and give yourself rest. And if you're in an occupational setting with really loud noises, um, when I see my lawn man come, he's always got good ear protection on. In fact, he does not take them off to talk to me when I come out until he cuts the motor. And if your young children um, or other younger relatives are going to loud concerts, um, you can have permanent ear damage from just one really loud uh, event. Also, if you are a a recreational uh, shooter or a hunter, uh, the the fire and the ammunition, of course, can be extremely loud and can damage the ears. Uh, construction sites are another um, source. People in the uh, musical and theatrical businesses also need to help protect their special senses because we want you to be strong and healthy and in charge. And thank you so much for joining us in the Sunflower House today. And if you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, uh, please give us a five-star rating. And if you want to help support our nonprofit, Speaking of Women's Health, please share this podcast with others. Share our website, Speaking of Women's Health dot com and uh, leave us a five star rating too if you would and to catch all the latest from me you can subscribe to our podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts sometimes I help my patients if there's any extra time at the end of the visit uh, to go on their uh, smartphone and if they have the Apple podcast little purple icon I just say put speaking of women's health in and click the follow or subscribe button. Other places, Apple, uh, besides Apple Podcast or Amazon Music, Podcast Addict, iHeartRadio, Overcast, Spotify, TuneIn, wherever you listen to podcasts. So thanks again for joining me in the Sunflower House, and I look forward to seeing you again 